so I, I walked past an art gallery in Soho a few months ago, um, and this artwork by Tim Etchells, um, I saw it and I realized that basically I can reply to every email with just this phrase. <laughs> the future will be confusing. Um, hello, I'm Chris. Uh, I'm a designer that can't draw. I really can't draw. <laughs> Um, so if I can't draw, um, what do I work in and what do I design in? Well, um, the best way of describing it is that my medium is the present, um, or actually the, the recently possible. So for about 15 years I've been working with mobile phones, the internet, GPS, Wi-Fi, games consoles, um, things that are suddenly ubiquitous in the world. Um, and I'm a great believer in something called self-ethnography, which is basically making things, trying them out on yourself, and seeing how you react to them. Um, and just as an example, in 2004, um, I hacked together a mobile phone, a GPS unit, what would now be called an app on the phone. Um, and basically, I published my location live on my website um, for anyone to see. Um, and it produced, you know, lovely sort of maps like this. Um, this is a boat ride in Helsinki to get to the zoo. And I walked around the zoo. Um, but what was really interesting is it felt like you were, you were, you were drawing a line just by moving. Um, it feels very different when you know that you're constructing a map like this. Now, unfortunately, um, I got some of the maths wrong. Um, and a colleague sort of rang me up going, are you OK? Because um, it th uh, he thought I was in the middle of the Baltic Sea. <laughs> um, Warren Ellis also, um, his first reaction was, you're going to get robbed. And I'm like, well, I'm in Helsinki. That doesn't really happen. It's fine. Um, so I believe in designing through making um, and making enough to get you into trouble. Um, and it's only through making mistakes can you really learn what technology does and what it means and how it can change things. Um, and I really do believe designers have a responsibility. If you design something, you should live with it and the consequences of it, even if there are unintended consequences, because there always is. Um, uh, this is an app that um, came out about a month ago and has already been banned. Um, it's called Girls Around Me. It uses Foursquare data, so you check into a location um, and Facebook profiles and just merges them together, works out where there are girls, and gives you enough information to try and hit on them. Um, it's, you know, it's deeply creepy. Um, to, and I'm going, you know, lots of my friends are programmers. I've, I'm an ex-programmer. Um, to a programmer, this is just taking bits of data that already exist in the public domain and putting them together. They, they wouldn't necessarily see why this is different. But it is, and as a designer, I, you know, I should feel that by putting this together, it's going to make something quite horrible. Um, so why will the future be confusing for all of us? Um, quite simply, technology. Um, and that's been the case for at least 150 years. Um, things like steam, power, and electricity, and telecommunications causes revolutions. Um, but our, and our revolution will be basically computation. Uh, there's a thing called Moore's Law. Uh, Gordon Moore um, is one of the founders of Intel. And he just made, he's an engineer, and he just made an observation in, I think, 1965, that every 24 months, um, you could basically build a computer that was twice as fast. He was wrong. Um, they were doubling every 18 months. Um, and that's continued since 1965 to this day. In fact, it's getting quicker in some ways. And the reason it, it hasn't stopped is because that became Intel's business plan. He just said that this will happen every, every 18 months. The computers will get twice as fast. And because it's Intel's business plan, it's now everyone's business plan. Because so many businesses are affected by computers and technology. And how can every business cope with the fact that their computers get twice as good every 18 months? One of the side effects is that the idea of having personal computers and personal computation is no longer a luxury. You know, there was this idea that 
you know, originally someone said that you, there might be three computers in Britain or something. Um, now you're lucky if someone hasn't got three computers strapped to them in some way. Um, toys, if anyone is going to take technology and make it cheap and ubiquitous, it's toy manufacturers. Um, this is the Fur Real Friends uh, Biscuit My Living Puppy. Um, now the important thing, um, it features voice recognition. It obeys six commands. Um, uh, ask him if he wants a treat and he'll nod and whimper to let you know he's ready for his dog bone. Um, this is, you know, pretty normal for a toy to be able to recognize you as a human, either your face or your voice. Um, and a sort of a 40 buck pocket camera now um, recognizes 10 to 15 faces. Um, and that's more than a six month old child. So we've got to a point where basically everything, every bit of, everything we buy is a computer in some way. Um, and computers are actually better than humans at some things. Um, they're great at making very clear cut decisions. They're great at sensing the world better than us. And they're great at repetition. You know, they don't want breaks. They work 24 seven. Um, but they're incredibly bad at things like critical judgment, creativity, and the sort of the craft of making things. And I want to be really, really clear. Um, I'm not talking about artificial life. I'm not talking about singularity, where suddenly the robots will rise against us because they get more intelligent than us. Um, humans program computers. So, you know, programmers, designers have a responsibility of the things they make. Um, and you might say, great, you know, I've got a computer at home, I've got an iPhone, whatever. Um, how does that change our life? Well, it isn't just things like what you would call computers. Um, I could have picked from a million examples of how they are changing your life. Um, I can talk for an hour on any of these topics and many, many more. But I wanted to focus on one that maybe people hadn't thought about, um, and that's genetics. Um, I'm not a scientist, I don't even play one on TV, um, but genetics is basically what, what's called big data. Um, every one of us contains DNA, um, and that's basically 3.3 billion bits of information. That's a big number. Um, it's, if you boil it down, it's basically about a CD's worth of data. Every one of us is about a CD's worth of data. Uh, another way of looking at it, um, this is a bookcase in the Wellcome Collection in London um, containing a complete human genome. Um, so we're about a bookcase worth of information as well. Um, getting to this was a huge project. Um, the first human genome was sequenced in 2004 um, and took 14 years, and that's just for one person. Uh, by 2008, five people had had their genomes mapped. Um, this is a slide from the American government. Um, so the first one cost $100 million. Where we're getting to is, well, by the end of 2011, it was about eight, nine thousand $9,000. And we're at about 1,000, 2,000 now for, your, for a complete genome sequence of you. Um, and it's very likely in about three years' time you'll be able to pay $100 and get your complete genome. Why would you want that? Um, we'll see. Um, in fact, we don't need to sequence an entire human genome. Um, my genes are 99% the same as each of yours. Um, they're exactly the same. Uh, there's only 1% that's different. And that's about eight megabytes of data, you know, quite a large photo or a YouTube, a YouTube clip. Um, and there's a company called 23andMe um, that for 100 bucks will sequence what they th currently consider the most important million genes of yours. 98% accuracy, which is actually pretty good. Um, this is how it works. You pay your 99 bucks, they send you a kit, you spit into a tube, you send it to their lab, 
you log on and see your genes. That's the kit. I paid my 100 bucks. I spat in the tube. Um, by the end of this, this year, you might be able to do it at home. This is a USB stick um, by an Oxford um, genetics company um, that will do the same. But why is it important? Well, this idea of ubiquitous genetics, everyone knowing their genome, um, completely changes how medicine works. Um, so I'm going to show you my genes. Um, you don't want to be a hypochondriac if you do this. <laughs> um, even when you've, you've, you, you know, you've paid your money, you've sent your, your little tube of spit off, and it takes a few weeks for them to process it, you get an email saying you can now log on, and you get a huge warning saying, like, do you really want to do this? Um, it will reveal things that maybe you didn't want to know or you feel you shouldn't need to know. Um, I believe that you know, information is power, so I, this is, I clicked. Um, as you have noticed, uh, the, the things I have an elevated risk of diseases of, I've, I've blanked out. Um, I will happily tell anyone in the pub what they are. Um, if you look, you know, I have a 60% risk of getting a certain disease, which is up from 47, which is the average. It, that's, that's quite scary. Um, in the US, by law, no one can use this data against me. The fact I know these things cannot increase the cost of my insurance or change the way I, I get health care. Um, but there's no such act in the UK. Um, there is an industry moratorium until 2017. Um, but I have no idea what public opinion will be like then, and I don't want this video used against me in the future. Uh, I do have a superpower, though. Um, I'm resistant to noroviruses. Um, I, it, it's, it's one gene that pretty much defines whether you, will, you will, could potentially suffer from noroviruses. So this is the one superpower I've found. Um, but this, I think, is that it's... There's a, lot of, there's a lot of debate, I guess, about how this information is used. Um, this, I think, is the, one of the most interesting things, um, whether I carry certain genes. Um, now, I'm gay, so I probably won't procreate. But if I did, I would probably want to know this. But if you want, you know, do you really want to know this? I, it's, it, there are lots of ethical questions that come up from knowing your genes and then what you do in your life with those. Um, it's a huge ethical can of worms, and I think only as people start to experience it and seeing their reality will they really understand how that makes them feel and what, how that changes, sort of how the public will use this stuff. Um, so the big change will be that medicine goes from averages, which is what most research is based on, um, to individuals, and everyone will need very different treatments and very different medicine. In fact, you know, one of the, one of the uh, things you get is how will you respond to certain drugs? Um, most new drugs that are being developed will work for less than 50% of the population. And only by knowing your genes can they work out if a treatment is right for you or not. Now that's amazing and will, you know, it will change the way that, we, that medicine happens and how we're treated in the future. Um, but I'm also more interested in how this affects you day to day. Um, so there's one interesting thing which is that um, exercise and how you respond to it is actually very much determined by your genes. Um, this is one gene that determines whether you're going to be an Olympic class sprinter or not. I'm not. Um, <laughs> And never will be. It's like, you know, it, it, it's written there. I can't change that. Um, there was a BBC programme a few months ago called The Truth About Exercise. Um, and, it, and they talked to some researchers that had been working on um, whether people respond to exercise. So, like, will, you know, will your oxygen capacity increase as you do more exercise? Because that's what you're told. You know, do your two and a half hours of exercise a week and you'll get better and fitter. And it, and it turns out that's probably not true. 
Um, BBC News uh, linked to the article, which is in the Journal of Applied Physiology. Um, the interesting thing is you actually had to go to their patent to find the genes and, and know what they were talking about. And of course, the community at 23andMe had already done this um, and made it very easy for you to click through and see what your genes told you about how you'll exercise. It turns out I'm somewhere in the middle. Um, because you're looking at sort of, I think, 11 genes, um, they found that you know, some people are uh, probably like six times better at responding to exercise than others. Um, I'm really also interested in food and cooking. Um, could our genes mean that we taste things differently to each other? Um, could we get to a point where you get a, a, a personalized menu based on you spitting into a tube. Um, actually, we have very little, well, not little idea, but we have a, a very nascent idea of how smell and taste works. Um, most of what you were taught in biology about four basic ten, uh, tastes, five basic tastes, may not be true. Um, one, one gene is responsible for whether you can smell asparagus in your wee. <laughs> Who here can smell asparagus in their wee? Um, it's about 20%, I think, of people that can't. Um, so now, um, let's look at another taste, which is bitterness. Um, you each have an envelope. <laughs> okay, I will preface this about if, if science works, about 20% of you will really hate this. <laughs> Uh, inside um, your envelope, you'll find an emergency barley sugar um, and a little strip of white paper. Has everyone got a little strip of white paper? Yeah. Now, um, I'm going to get you to taste this in a second. Um, you will have one of three responses. You will either taste nothing, it will taste bitter to you, but okay, and some people will find this the bitterest thing they've ever tasted and will need to deploy the emergency barley <laughs> show. So um, get a little bit of spit in your mouth, um, just stick this on your tongue, don't swallow it, um, and see what you taste. Uh. <laughs> So, who here could taste nothing? Science! Um, who here could taste something bitter, but it was okay? Uh, and who here thought that was the worst thing they've ever tasted in their life? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Deploy the emergency barley sugars. Um, so what this means is, if you couldn't taste it, you're called taste blind. Um, you could probably, you probably, you know, you can't really taste things like asparagus and, and rhubarb. Um, if you had a slightly bitter reaction, you're a normal taster. If you, if it was really bad, then you're considered a super taster. Being a super taster is not a good thing. If you like food, um, you will tend to eat sweet things, uh, cakes. Um, you will avoid bitter things. Um, and it turns out that, yeah, once again, this is a gene. Um, uh, it's this one gene. Um, I've got CG response, which means I can taste certain bitter flavors. If you, if you have a CC on your gene, it means you have an 80% chance of not, not being able to taste bitter things. And um, what's interesting is that they're working out why. I mean, there has to be some evolutionary reason for this. Um, and the, the, uh, there's an idea that um, basically, you know, bitter, bitter plants are basically normally poisonous. Um, but there might be some plants where you would want, you know, like cabbages and brassicas, where the nutritional value is, is decent enough. So it's, it's having this fine line reaction between having no, no bitter taste and too much bitter taste. 
Um, so this is the gene. It's on our seventh chromosome. Um, you can do this test as many times as you like. It won't change the reaction. Um, I'm just going to end with a quote by one of my favorite people, um, Alfred North Whitehead, who is a science philosopher. Um, there's not enough science philosophy these days. Um, in 1925, he wrote a book called Science in the Modern World. Um, and he just says, it is the business of the future to be dangerous. And it is amongst the merits of science that it equips the future for its duties. Thank you.